Hello and welcome, welcome to Monarchism Unfiltered. I'm one of your hosts, Nicole. I'm I am, and this is Bruns. And today hey, we I'm have I'm a guest, Spruce Goose. Howdy. Howdy. So today we're talking about liberalism, um, and obviously its relation to monarchism. Um, I think Nikoski you can sort of start off, as it were. Pleasure. So, dear listener, or reader, or, or however you consume this podcast, even though it's only in a single medium, uh, today, today's topic is liberalism, its relationship to monarchism, but also uh, consider, considerations about liberalism in of itself and its relation to the often pegged, uh, to its often pegged direct connection to democracy in of itself. So, so let, let, let's start with the basics. Liberalism, when did it start it? Depending on who you ask from the French Revolution to 18, to, to early 1800s UK. It, it became the, it be, in its early days, it was about giving more rights to the people, had a, mono, or had a modernizing aesthetic, was uh, opposed to absolutism, though not necessarily monarchism in general, and has since become more or less the dominant world ideology, essentially. Yeah, I mean, I'd agree with that. I, I think the, the best place to, to sort of quote-unquote date the beginning of um, liberalism as an ideology um, would be, say, someone like John Locke. And obviously, with John Locke, um, you do generally get or like for for john locke it is quite clear that he um he wants a monarch he thinks that you should have a monarch um as a part of um as a part of your your system um the i think um where you start getting i think liberals that who aren't monarchists would be someone like Rousseau. Um, Rousseau, I think, is the first person really to be kind of anti-monarchist in a systematic way. Though you get it, obviously, earlier with various Protestants, uh, the Monarcho, Max, and so forth. So, liberalism, like many, like many an ideology, is not static. It has evolved it had many it had uh, many schisms and is equal and is also sometimes incredibly frustrating to define in a concise manner yeah i mean i i think the at least in terms of the schisms um i think there's something one sort of interesting things is one, one interesting thing that has developed since John Locke um, and the kind of changes that have taken place. You know, obviously you have people like um, Edmund Burke as well, who is a liberal but is um, is also a conservative. Is that I think there has been um, a move towards mass democracy as a principle, um, which arguably starts with the French Revolution, which is why I think. It, can be fair to date the beginning of liberalism to the French Revolution. But certainly I think the kind of key thing that monarchism, as far as I can tell, would be opposed to would be um, mass democracy, especially in the current form that we have it. Um, the sort of, you know, the, the, the kind of democracies that we've had since um, since really um, the development of mass communication, so probably um, probably since the end of World War II, really, um, and that that kind of tendency seems to need to emerge from the French Revolution, um, and to a very significant degree be somewhat unconnected from, say, the writings of John Locke um, or or um, someone like Burke. 
So there's a the funny bit here is like there's these schisms within liberalism. Like there's two, I think, two big ones that I would uh, describe as kind of definitive to um, how we understand liberalism historically and contemporaneously. One is the the difference between uh, liberalism and like classical liberalism, which is very badly used as a term, and another uh, basically an ideology that is commonly rendered as classical republicanism. Um, and uh, if classical liberalism uh, begins arguably with Locke, um, classical republicanism has more to owe oh, to um, Hobbes, yes, and like Machiavelli often, but the major influence um, going forward through it is the um, a lot of uh, early Italian historians, guys like Vico, mostly like there's a huge thread with Tacitus in this. It's very interesting. But this um, this kind of ideology was very close to what liberalism when it originated, but it didn't really take in the, in the same way. Uh, it, uh, like, uh, probably one of the premier examples of classical republicanism uh, is Dubrovnik uh, as a city-state, which was the longest running quote unquote democracy. Like if you're going to call Athens a democracy, Dubrovnik was a democracy as well. Uh, ran a state that existed for about 900 years and basically had a three tiered caste system with a class of quite literally poet aristocrats who uh, formed the um, Democratic Congress of the city. And the, uh, the thing that classical republicanism resembles the most is not uh, liberalism Classical liberalism, as we understand it now, and certainly not neoliberalism, but um, a sort of uh, uh, Confucian state, almost. Um, in, in line, not, not necessarily neo-Confucian state, but is a very similar sort of emphasis on um, uh, a sort of secularized ritual, as well as a... Um, it's, it's usually described as civic humanism, but it's a definite sense of... Um, it would it would be proto nationalism at the time. So uh, so state religion based oh civic uh, so civic proto civic religion kind of like with Dubrovnik it's an interesting example because Dubrovnik was um, well it's, let's see what's now Croatia but it's a very Catholic city at the time and um, well uh, <laughs> you know there's intense relations you know between Catholicism and Orthodoxy and Islam in that part of the world in general but that was a huge part of their identity there. And uh, there's a sense of, I think, uh, one thing about uh, Catholicism, whether or not uh, the ideology is carried, there's a very strong commonality between Catholic social teaching and uh, successful democratic movements. Uh, a good examples of that are things like, um, like today are things like uh, Emilia Romagna in Italy uh, or um, ba the Basque province in Spain or in my home country of Canada, the Antigonish Project. Um, and uh, these ideas are closer to closer to they wouldn't be called classical republicanism by any means because they don't really have a state apparatus, but they're closer to that idea than they are to any sort of classical liberal and definitely neoliberal political order. And that's the other schism in liberalism is between classical liberalism and neoliberalism, which I think is a false dichotomy. Um, Classical liberalism, as it's used right now, you get guys like Dave Rubin going, they're classical liberals. No, Dave Rubin's a libertarian who uh, doesn't have the, the like the spine to say like he's kind of okay with a world where roads don't exist. And neoliberalism is uh, just this uh, grown to its logical conclusion with the, the information apparatus that we see today. Uh, and neoliberalism as an ideology... Uh, like the thing about the funny thing I've mentioned Edmund Burke, Edmund Burke may be the closest thing to a like central tentpole in philosophy because liberalism, the, the distinction in a lot of Western countries between liberalism and conservatism, which is kind of a false dichotomy because neoliberalism and neoconservatism have like 90% identical goals. It, it does uh, manifest often in this sort of shared affinity for some ideas with Edmund Burke. It's very interesting to see that play out. Neoliberalism would be the order that exists right now under the American cultural hegemon. And broadly speaking, uh, 
fundamentally works on the assumption that uh, it, it's sort of a soft minarchism a bit, but it doesn't really work that way. Like it's uh, the assumption that there's basically three central assumptions. Markets are good. Uh, markets scale evenly across uh, national and cultural boundaries. And both of these things can be enforced. Uh, the connections to that, I mean, after the Iraq war and so forth, after what is essentially a real, some incredibly failed empire shit. I mean, we're talking about what's going on in Afghanistan right now. That's like, that's fucking Oswald Spengler failed empire shit to the max. Um, maybe not, but the, <laughs> it's up there. It's the, it's, it's very concerning, uh, to see these things play out in a certain way. But the idea that neoliberalism has become, it's a default. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's become the realization of uh, canceling the future for a lot of people. And it's very, in that way, departs from like, even like, like the good faith dreams of most, like not just John Locke, but like guys like Ishia Berlin. I mean, if we're going to credit good faith to Fukuyama, him too. I mean, Fukuyama now says he wants socialism to come back, which basically just means <laughs> social democracy. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you've hit the nail on the head with that distinction between classical republicanism and um, classical liberalism, um, especially because you, I think, if, if you go look at something that's interesting to read is uh, the the uh, the works of the levelers. The levelers were very influenced by um, Roman Roman conceptions of the state, um, and the the image of like the um, of the gentleman on on the land, basically. That they kind of felt that they wanted to extend to um, to like all 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 persons in England, basically. Which is why the the levelers were in favor of suffrage for all heads of household, and um, and they they definitely had this kind of neo Roman element that you highlighted of Tacitus and um, and Ma uh, Machiavelli's discourses on Levy and, and this sort of thing. Um, I think I think more broadly in terms of um, conservatism and liberalism it seems to me that at least in the west when we talk about um mainstream politics we're essentially talking about a disagreement by and large over the size of the state not so much the role of the state or even um or even um foreign policy most of the time um it will in the u.s i think it's sort of you know it's like how brutal are we in foreign policy and how brutal are we in domestic policy yep. um, and how brutal are we in monetary policy but that's yeah. uh yeah exactly and yeah i mean the, the the democrats uh want to possibly stick it to the banks a bit more but there well, is like the the only difference between one side of the aisle and the other in the us is one side is asking how little should we care and the other one is asking how little can we care yeah um and sorry yeah i mean i think there was a there was some articles i read a while back which made this point of like we're all we're all now living in a hamiltonian world um obviously with the debates between like jefferson and hamilton um or the yeah the federalist and the anti-federalist papers and it seems to me very much that there has been this conver uh, convergence towards um towards a specific vision of the state um and a specific vision of history um that is quite particular to to um to liberalism um and that seems to me to basically be centered around the nation state more than anything else um I'm not sure if you'd agree, though, but with the the idea of the nation state as sort of the building block of um, a contemporary sort of liberalism. Yes. Yeah. 
to a degree, it's true, but uh, it's one of those things where um, that, uh, like, there's one analysis that I think, like, from the economic end of it, that's very interesting is that of um, distributist economics, especially G.K. Chesterton's analysis. And G.K. Chesterton posited that there were uh, three economic systems feasible. There is capitalism, there is socialism, and then there is proletarianism. And neither of the first two were ever implemented on any successful scale. But the third is the one that has been fundamentally realized throughout history. The main difference is that it under, for example, like under feudalism, for example, like before capitalism originated, as we would say, or before that became realized or before industrialization, like whatever benchmark there is, that was centered on this kind of um, um, sacral concentration of force. Like there's, you know, divine right of kings and so forth. I believe you covered this on your podcast, actually, with the origins of it was the, you know, the, the link between kingship and priesthood. But then when you introduce the what we would now call the, the market economy, that concentration necessarily verges towards a commercialized concentration of force. And it's not to say that it wasn't before because the way tides go up, right? Like it's it, like there's many ways that the structure of central banking em emulates that of feudalism. But the, the shift is towards this idea of um, uh, this, uh, what's the best phrase for it? Because I was going to say denatured, but it's like, um, uh, um, it, it's uniquely unconcerned with objectives. It's, um, it's, it's a rationale, economically speaking, that is kind of just focused on some idea of growth. Um, John Medaille, who's another, who's a distributist thinker right now, actually has a very good, uh, description of this. He's described this as the ideology of the cancer cell. Um, and because of that, it's the same sort of pattern of concentration of centralization, but it's given with a communications apparatus and especially with a fiscal apparatus, like things like fractional reserve banking, the ability to just concentrate this, uh, power past the point, quite literally past the point of reality. Because the majority of money in the world that is on balance sheets doesn't exist. But that is also what, at this point, connects, like, holds up any given hegemon. Like, it, it doesn't really work. You can't really have a broke hegemon in the world. Unless we're talking, like, some sort of syndicalist pipe dream. But like, there is um, this great reality. This The, the reality is that it became uh, pragmatized, but also kind of... It's just like, it's a train where they're building the tracks down as the train. It's like, um, oh, what's the book? Um, Iron Council by China Maville. Uh, interesting book. Uh, in that one, there's a civilization on a, this train, kind of Snowpiercer style, except it's a socialist uh, group, essentially. And they build the tracks in front of the train to keep it going. And the uh, there's a few problems with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the the I'd agree with it's actually that image of um, the ideology of the cancer cell. Um, I think what is quite interesting, at least if we compare um, this image of sacral power versus um, monetary power, um, and I, I think why why I sort of moved to look at the um, the nation state is in part because the I think the big difference between classical liberalism and arguably uh, classical republicanism is the concentration of state power in a centralized apparatus that is believed to um, to um, in sort of classical terms the modern state has both power and authority um, in the in the in Roman times, the people have power and the state has authority. Um, obviously, in the Middle Ages, the church has authority and the state has power. But it seems to me that in in, uh, in modern times, we have moved to a point at which um, both 
the state has both power and authority where authority is sort of what you should do and what um, and the execution of it being power and i think what the nation state more than anything else has proclamated um is that like it almost that it's god as as we might see in like giovanni gentile um i think gentile mm. makes this quite explicit burke from what i have read of him seems to have this as well um in his like discourses against christianity basically hey, gentile is a very you know is an interesting sort of um touchstone for this because he belongs to like it's a really idiosyncratic tradition he's like he's one of those guys that um like it's mentioned a lot alongside schmidt you know i mean for for that's for more of a uh that's for the million yeah that's for the I mean, milieu, but like there's this um hegelianism to him to, to what he wanted to to enact that's really it's 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 a, it's a little tragic to, to think about um he was he was a uh, heavily influenced by um oh um uh, I'm blanking on his name right now but um, Barclay and Fichte is, is his two main influences uh the fellow uh, Croce uh, Benedetta Croce yeah 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 uh, yeah. yeah Croce as well yeah mm -hmm. um yeah I mean I, I think he I think he is a good touchstone for this because of his belief that like the state was the logos um. So, like, the, I think there is definitely a degree to which what he sort of says, um, it does seem to me that modern, modern liberalism, especially with the kind of power and control that people have around borders now, um, kind of reflects in his own thought. Um, and especially, I mean, you know, when we talk about we live in, Amer in an American world, these sorts of ideas, um, I think it's not unreasonable to say that he was to a certain degree right, that we, that like the state is basically now the Logos, um, though he meant that in a more metaphysical sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, and that's sort of the interesting thing that I think liberalism has produced. Um, Though not, not everyone endorses that, obviously, within liberalism. Well, so one, one interesting example I do uh, point out here in what's one sort of unlikely sort of distinction uh, between uh, uh, democracy and liberalism isn't like, not, no, I'm not talking about Viktor Orban. Like, Viktor Orban says, we have an illiberal democracy. Nah, it's, it's not what you got. <laughs> that's, 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 a, that's a nice way of putting that. Um, one sort of, complication um that is i mean you guys are kaiserite guys right yes yeah. yeah, generally so uh, I suppose you could say that in a way even though ck2 is still the big dog on the block how do you feel about huey long i mean huey long is a bit of a you know he's a bit of a meme on the internet but like historically he's I, I think he's much more interesting as a historical character than as, as anything else, um, especially the systems of patronage that he created. He really was like. There's um, the thing about Huey Long is that um, like there are guys like Huey Long, and for very different reasons, Douglas MacArthur was like this as well, uh, who were able to basically. Um, win at these principles, basically very similar to those of classical republicanism. Uh, because like MacArthur did this in Taiwan, where it's, uh, this is another policy often lumped in distributism, uh, where he basically uh, shifted a, a, a feudal farming economy towards the ownership of the farmers. Um, and like MacArthur, you can say a lot of bad things about MacArthur, and there, you should be, because he was quite, quite literally willing to create with to uh, embark on a, like the ending of Doctor Strangelove um, as a military policy. But when you're talking about, for example, like authority, for example, MacArthur was a, a person who lived his entire, like much of his entire life because he appointed himself to this. He probably had quite literally had a God complex, had this idea of um, uh, 
uh, authority that I wouldn't be at all surprised to say he either got, I, I don't know if he ever read Thomas Carlyle, but he kind of probably got the impression of there are great men in history and I'm one of them. Gabriel Denunzio had the same idea. Um, and because of that, like there's, there's, it's a very dangerous thing because in principle, that's terrifying. In execution, that is a big win or a big loss. And like, when you talk about Huey Long, who I would say for one reason is admirable and that's, he's probably the one person in American history uh, who successfully stood up to standard oil, like Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, maybe he's fucking Teddy Roosevelt. Like the, there's this real like power, especially for like, just the sense of, I mean, it's ironic seeing like Huey Long as a populist, certainly as a Democrat, like small D Democrat, it's a very complicated thing. I, I would still see Huey Long as a more um, intriguing example of a, like a successful statesman and a successful example of what it means to create these practicable goals. Um, like regardless of how it stands, like Huey Long was going to win in Louisiana. It was what he had to do to do it. And like, there's the thing where it's like, uh, he took the money, he courted the clan, and then he used their money to um, uh, establish like, um, what was it? The first, uh, I, I don't know if, I, I don't think they were integrated schools, but they were like schools in a black, in, in black parishes. Like it's, it's that kind of thing where it's like, it is, it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's sort of, you are a law unto yourself, um, and a kind of world unto yourself, and I, yeah, I mean, you see that, you see this, there is this kind of Carlyle-ness, Carlyle-ness to it. Um, Carlos? No, that's not it. Thomas Carlyle? Carl, Carlyle? Carl, yeah. Carlyleian? Yeah, Carlylean is, Carl, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's sort of, you know, it's like, um, if you read the end of Thus Spake Zarathustra, he has this sort of discourse with the, um, the, la the Last Supper of the Higher Men, um, and the kings sort of talk about, like, uh, the sort of great political leaders, um, sort of have this big old discourse where they're they talk to Zarathustra and there, I think people like Huey Long and MacArthur, I mean, MacArthur was very, very much a political animal. Um, they seem to me to have this kind of element of, um, this kind of almost Napoleonic element to them. Um, that I, I'm not sure that any other politician in the U S really had, or even to my knowledge, every, anywhere else too much um maybe someone like vargas is similar um and i think they do to a great degree define modern liberalism um and this this uh especially something like the united states i think there is a there is a way that the united states, we do kind of live in the world of the u.s and at the the U.S.'s beck and call, basically, um, which I think we're seeing, especially with Trump now, has some shortcomings. Let's, let's say, has some mild shortcomings. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. To say it lightly, and I mean, I, I think, yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, I think that is. It's fair to say that there, there are some mild shortcomings there, but I think um, it's interesting the degree to which I, I, I wonder how intentional um, the, the world of the US uh, that liberalism has produced was on its own end, um, especially, say, someone like John Locke or Russo, I, I don't think I, I don't think either of them would have liked the world that we no, now find ourselves in for quite different reasons. Um, but it seems to me that especially someone like Burke would somewhat be satisfied, and I, I think that's quite. I mean, 
to 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 weigh in on this, th there was a split uh, about that in liberalism. The split, the, the now long forgotten split, my lad, between the radicals and well, the liberals. The split, the the radicals would later on go on to become like, both also and caps and libertarians, but also the first social democrat, democratic socialists, and etc. 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 Like well, there was a split. Yeah, a very early split that has since morphed onto these ideologies. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I mean, there there are these kind of forgotten states, especially in like France, you know, um, mountain and so forth. But I, I think there is a, it seems to me that, uh, that the kind of political philosophy that um, that Burke and and and, and so forth um, produced. It it seems to me that liberalism kind of in a way escaped itself, um, which is interesting in the with the if you consider the issue of democratic overflow. Um, where it almost seems like what mass democracy unsealed the lid on was on like the the expansion of the state and of state power um and you know professional armies these sorts of things uh explosion of state capacity um ability to gather revenue so on and so forth that do kind of all flow out of, of democracy um, where having the kinds of democracy that we have now allow for you to much more easily justify much larger taxes than one could justify um, could justify under under an absolute monarch I mean the 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 the, the, the greatest um... The greatest irony, uh, well, not irony, the greatest confirmation of that statement is the often theorized direct link between uh, democracy, quote unquote, to fascism. That the that there is a, a a direct through line between one and the other. And as I mentioned, the, the fact that democracy naturally lends itself to an ever increasing to an ever increasing state power and is one is one of the multiple pathways it can take towards fascism. The ultimate debate is is uh, if if democracy and by extension Monday manifestations of liberalism are in are just a, pre a preparatory stage towards uh, fascism, or 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 is fascism just uh, a, a a a corruption of democracy and not the necessary end point. Well, so there's a there's a bit of a pushback I have here on this one because there's um the one thing there's one thing about the democratic apparatus that exists, especially within the American hegemon, but there is a uh, idea to it that is more or less top down, and then that in turn does necessarily like it, that that because it lends itself to uh, centralization and federal like like you mentioned earlier this Hamiltonian world like the issue with the uh, many forms of this like centralization i mean if we're going to talk about lenin here democratic centralism even if you do have democratic centralism the issue is that it is impossible it, it doesn't function unless it's heavily federated and within that you get establishments of oligarchies that become entrenched in either business or governmental communities or in the case of the american example both and the difference between imposing that and then having benefits either um trickled either as for example those who the, the question for those who say how much uh should we care uh yeah is wait how much should we care how much can we care i forgot i forgot my original analogy the yeah, that um, was the uh, one party says how much should we care the other says how much can we care yeah uh, mm -hmm. how, well, how little much how, yeah, yeah. How, how much can we get away with not caring? Yeah, yeah. That's a, so the the idea with both of those things in a centralized political system, which the states very much is, is that um, 
there are two ways you can confer benefits on the actual voting population is you can do it paternalistically or you can do which is what the um let's say well that's 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 what essentially the american left wing would generally do uh is they would like to create these programs and like there, there's the dueling tax benefits every election cycle but like the like the the american like the the the, the soaked so gems and so forth have essentially a paternalistic social policy and then on the other side of it the um like the, the fundamental core of republicanism is strip away as much as you can so that only people come to you who have bought into everything else. So have bought into a very uh, bellicose individualized capitalist state or functionally proletarian state, because it's this it's a way to essentially weed out anyone who does not buy into these attributes either. And because a lot of these attributes are fun, are kind of inherent, like there's uh, are deemed inherent, I should say, because there's definitely, I mean, there's definitely a, uh, like profound systematic racist element to it and a like pro and a well, profoundly sexist element to it. But within that as well, there is this way of basically through like creating fascism through minarchism, if that makes sense, because you're the only way to gain access to anything really is to, is to join in either in a fitting or more extreme way. It's like, um, it, it it would be it's it's like if the the masons method of organization was just on crack it's like the masons by way of nick land which is basically hans hermann hoppe and that's where you get anti-democratic liberalism too which is uh like if we're doing political compass reference that's like in the lib right quadrant of the um political spectrum like a good benchmark for it is objectivism and then you get to anarcho-capitalism and the thing is, there's a back door to fascism because of Hoppe. Like Hoppe is, um, if you think they talk about Caitlin Bennett or uh, <laughs> or Curtis Curtis Yarvin, yeah, both of those guys, um, both those people rather, uh, basically have, have be became fascists in one way or another through Hoppe. Like they started out as libertarians and then American style libertarians, and then they got there because the pitch is already there. Like the pitch is already that within this hegemon, there is a certain class of people, like going back to like the people who venerate the founding fathers, a certain class of a uh, military officer or business owner, uh, which which we'll say is a certain demographic, is is the the generally the the quiet part often said loud. Uh, and then within if then all you have to do is join that rank. And if you can't, then, well, I don't know, sucks to be you. I guess, I guess it's new serfdom because it's not, it's like, uh, and that this is in, kind of incipient to neoliberalism because the thing about neoliberalism is that neoliberalism is an ideology kind of premised on the idea that slavery is inherently bad. Wage slavery could be okay. It's the, it's, it's, it's the not, well, not, it's not an endorsement of that, but it's a willingness to sort of remove that distinction. The, uh, the, it's like, it, the uh, the wrinkle added by um, shall we say uh, massive downward pressure, and then there's another way. Like as I would say now, I this may raise the hackles on some listeners. I am, as we've mentioned, I I am not I am, but the uh, I'm I say the token Democrat here, and uh, to me. The idea does come when you do the reverse, when you have bottom up organization, which is, I mean, one, it's, it's the only way to deal with certain realities. Um, I think climate change is maybe the best example uh, from a, like a sense of like lived community for most participants. And it's also a, a way to essentially uh, I don't want to say circumnavigate, but put in perspective uh, paternalism, especially on the federal level, because there is like the principle of subsidiarity is very valuable for evaluating this. But there are a lot of these issues that like simply saying that and this is a huge part of fascism is a mixture of extreme federal power and enforced corporatism. Which superficially resembles aspects of distributism, but there's this really there's it was there's this comic where it's like the like distributists are angry at the same things as fascists are, except fascists put triple parentheses on all the nouns. 
like you, you, joke, you, you joke, but uh, although Nazi Germany is often portrayed as this uh, totalitarian state that nationalized all the economy, the truth is it privatized the entire economy and had vi violent, vicious centralization and brutality. Yes. So it, it, it's it's not even a a, a, a a stretch of an imagination. I mean, and then, and yeah, and if you then look at, uh, I mean, Nazi German monetary policy was incredibly neoliberal, both in its privatization, and but and also its its massive focus on on keeping down inflation, which is the sort of when you talk about neoliberal economic policy, which is often viewed as sort of the reaction to Keynesianism, its main central tenet is the suppression of inflation. And the Nazis were incredibly good uh, neoliberals because they made raising prices a jailable offense. I mean, uh, another good comparison to the current American hegemon, probably the best, is what I would call the the, the gear cult. The um, it's like there's a a definite thought in uh, a lot of contemporary economic discourses that because it's taken for granted that infinite growth is. I don't even think possibility is factored in. They're just like, we have to keep doing this. And one of the easiest ways to do that is military spending. Because uh, it's, one, it's easy to pitch because are you not patriotic? Are there not wars all the time? But there's also this attitude that this is where technology is made. And like, this is like, this goes back to Eisenhower. This was Eisenhower's original point with the military industrial complex is that, you know, the, the machine provides its own reasons and then just, it has a very bellicose attitude to being interfered with, quite literally, and that that's what that's what uh, like the, like the we were talking about this before. The I mean, this is also owes to the massive consumption of meth. But like Panzer tanks are pieces of gear made by people who could clean the apartment with a toothbrush. Like they're incredibly meticulous and really expensive machines, and half of them broke in the mud fighting tanks that looked like they were welded together by a man drinking his own Molotov cocktails. Here yeah, first, folks, socioeconomics compared via tanks, a first for humanity. <laughs> I mean, I've seen it in a bunch of, I mean, it's not that uncommon. You just had to ruin the moment, didn't you? I had to, yes. That's what I have to do. But another good analogy, centralization, decentralization is the way warfare is just fought now, like because it's irregular warfare. It's it's there's no form of symmetrical warfare, like in at least it that most of these, like, frankly, imperial states are going to deal with. So you've got like perpetual war in Afghanistan, despite on paper that should not happen. Like there, there's the idea like, oh, how, what are we going to do? And it's this. Oh, yeah, the British were driven out of Afghanistan. The Russians were driven out of Afghanistan. And now it's a, it's like, um, I mean, the, the, it's like the thing that, um, a lot of, uh, sociology 101 students get from professors, but like, if you think one person can't make a difference, think of a, the, the gadfly sting, like think of like, think of a fly landing on your ear, or as I would say, regarding the gear cult, you might have a hundred thousand dollar Mercedes, but if someone's got a $1 bag of sugar, they can still fuck up your day. To 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 slightly go back to the topic of like modern warfare and it's and how it's combated in any in, in a very slight way is that what you say is actually currently the main the debate in terms of military theory, it but you have a Western-ish approach and outgrowth of the NATO doctrine of the fifties and sixties that is generally themed network-centric uh, uh, approach. Which is which is basically using just increasingly more technology to facilitate, or to facilitate either the 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 continuation or the survival of the current centralized structures, and then you have the exact inverse of that, which depending on who you ask is the revival of Nazi Germany tactics to uh, guerrilla warfare done legit, uh, is essentially just uh, warfare is now an inherently decentralized uh, affair, and therefore communication is less important. Initiative. And acquiescence of of uh, local of regionally important information is key, and you see this between the difference how America does things and how Russia does things. America tries to fucking uh, oh god I forgot a drone strike you to death, centrally command drone strikes you death. 
This often fails. You have issues with you don't know who you're shooting. Uh, random bombings don't ha aren't very useful if you don't have boots on the ground. Russia. Uh, oh, we just know that Crimea is unstable, unguarded, and we could probably bribe all the all the local oligarchs to joining us, and that's how they got Crimea. It's it's really amazing. Like I think Alexander Coburn had this point is about um, the first Gulf War. It was like they're like you can drop a bomb down his chimney. It's like that that bomb cost more than this guy's made in his life. And it's it's this idea like it's so asymmetrical it borders on cartoonish and it still doesn't work. It, it's one of those things where again the military industrial complex will eat itself. So will the tech sector. Like all of these things work on a variety of centralization that again you can credit fractional reserve banking for this as well as the fact that these guys like usually basically have sinecures. Like the thing about another thing too. I mean this contradicts the point about um, Chesterton earlier, but like. Socialism does exist in the United States. It just exists for people above a certain net worth, and that bar rises every year. Because once you become too big to fail, which is a very ahistoric way of viewing any single thing, like the, uh, it's it's like it it. it you're well, a you a car, basically, you you just become associated with success, and everyone starts bowing down to you and doing everything for your sake because they think if you fail, everything else fails. So you, you, you just become a new cargo cult. Well, and you get, this is the thing, as I, it's, it's Achilles dancing on a spike strip. You get this, it's, it's the Peter principle writ large because there's the point where these companies are like, oh yeah, we're too big to fail. And then the people who own them, the people who own them basically just go into like, it's like how uh, like, the actual owners of things are people who own like conglomerates and groups. And because of that, there is no real accountability or liability. Like insuring these things is such a bizarre clusterfuck of ideas because of that. And then of course, there's all the dominoes of debt that created the 08 crash and probably create another financial crisis sometime in the near future. And petrodollar, there's a lot of shit going on with that. And that's another kind of another thing. But the, uh, and then there's the whole like drying up of liquidity and the long term instability of interest rates. Yeah, it's like well, well, nobody's thinking there is no long term. There is no like the um, Exxon, like X. I mean Exxon. Let's like the thing about Exxon is that um, I, I kind of realized because like the thing about the oil industry is there's a unique evil to it. Like there's a there's an affront to like it it's it's this like functionally blasphemous attitude to how uh, the species and the planet works at this point. Like, um, well, some oil industry head, it wasn't Tillerson, said that, you know, he was going to do a good job with oil so that he could make a better world for his daughter. And every single year his daughter has been alive was hotter than the last one. There is no long-term thinking. There is no, because it's, it's not disincentivized, it's disrealized. Because that's what happens when you have this degree of centralization, this degree of just infinite gradations. And it's also what happens when you have what is, again, like this uh, headless feudal system kind of centered around central banks because the balance value of currency only works relative to who's next on the ladder. Like it's just fractional reserve banking. It's like we made up currency based on debt. And the farther you are away from the originator of the debt, the less value you get out of currency, which necessarily means that it becomes top down. To the point where, like, it, at its most cartoonish, like it, it's it's accidental currency devaluation on a regular basis, and that's kind of what the neoliberal hegemon means. What 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 uh, what was that quote? Capital capital capitalism will sell. The, the rope by which it will be hanged. I guess this also applies to the military industrial complex. Well, the military industrial complex, the banking, the, the whole shebang. Well, I mean, in a very real sense, like the Americans are fighting wars against people who are now, like American gear has outstripped Soviet gear for the, like ISIS was had um, American uniforms that they tailored. And this, the funny thing is the American gear is so much shittier because it's not like, it's like, it, it's an incredible, like, I'm, I, I've seen soft in the Soviets and I am not because again, it's a different, it's a different animal for centralization. But like, there's the thing is like, 
oh yeah, planned obsolescence doesn't really work here. So here's the Kalashnikov. You can bury this in a rice paddy and fill it with sand and you can still use it to like, like use it for whatever you use a gun for. And then you've got the M16 that's got like a bunch of gadgets, like the AR-15, whatever you can, you put a grenade launcher on it. You can, I don't know, you can hook it up to your iPhone. You can charge your jewel off the barrel of your AR-15, but oh wait, there's a grain of sand in the site. Okay, it won't fire, shit. You know, it's the, it really is, again, the gear cult eating itself. I mean, I mean, the most hilarious thing about American gear is that the vast majority of it is made by prison labor. Yep. So, that, so, 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 so the analogy just, get, just gets more and more bizarre. It's like, you really can't make this up, can you? Yeah. Um, and like the, the thing I think from a democratic angle is that um, part of the cancellation of the future is the idea that a very specific variety of um, neoliberal capitalism, neoproletarianism, whatever, is unavoidable. And because of the way this is presented itself, it basically means that the future itself is diminishing returns. And if you combine this with the, the ethic of like anti-democratic liberalism, this sort of this logical outcome of a lot of the American sphere of influence, there's a very scary reality. I don't think for the America, the United States itself, because I think they would have some kind of sea change before this happened, but definitely for their sphere of influence, for what you could call the American empire is there would be a sort of systematic collapse. Uh, it would be essentially scouring for parts not even from the Americans necessarily, just for just by other powers. I mean, the, the most obvious example of that is probably China, Russia to a degree. But like, there's this idea like if America goes, Taiwan and Singapore are up a creek are up shit creek without a paddle. I mean, and yeah. and and at least for a good two decades, Europe as well. Yeah, because your your Europe fun outside of like France and Turkey, Europe does not have functioning armies. Well, don't and uh, and Merkel and Macron creating basically the Grand Army of Europe. Well, yeah, because neither of them wants to pay money. That that's that's what that is. Neither of them want to pay money, because that's that's the overriding logic of of, of European armies. They exist for uh, for a number of reasons. Some of them legit, some of them not. But for the politicians, they exist as a kind of money sinkhole that doesn't do nothing so the argument is how to minimize cost at all times and and the, and this is how you end up with with like absurdities in budgeting training or just weapons like until 2010 the german army trained with brooms for christ's sakes uh, the, 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 the French tank, the Lecrec, that was built to fill inventory, it's so expensive and so poorly designed, it doesn't get fielded. Like, there is, there is profound issues with just European armies in general, and the issue is, is that without America, if you just dropped Europe... And, and you had even a remotely aggressive Russia, and well, Poland didn't exist. Uh, basically, basically, Russia could just march up all the way to Lisbon if it wanted, and no European state army could really provide a, a significant uh, defense. Really, only nukes would be able to stop any advance in that context. I would say as far as history goes, premising anything with uh, if Poland didn't exist is, tends to be a little bit of an issue. Po po the Polish army might have lackluster offensive capabilities, but by God, they will die to the last. They will. They will, like, that's like that Sabaton song, 40 to 1. That's an impressive, like, they're, like, the closest thing we have to Spartans. Well, them, the Finns, and, like, the Israelis, you know. Again, the, the issue with the... Strange, strange enough, outside of Ukraine, most uh, armies of states that border Russia tend to be okay, but limited in capacity, like... They're, they're very they're very one trick ponies, but they're very good at their one trick. And then you have the Baltic with, with their strategy, with their grand strategy being: if we get invaded, we run away all the way to France and pray to God. Another thing that keeps happening.
The uh, like, yeah, I mean, like, if there's a if there's a lesson here about um, the way liberalism has been interpreted, and I kind of side with John Ralston Saul on this one. Like, there's a a very like the gap between the implementation of the dreams of people like John Locke, but mostly like people like Jefferson. It's that never really came to fruition. Like there was, there were other things that like m history happened to them as it happened before. And like one hegemon, like in and of itself is just kind of, it, it, it's just trying again to create empire, trying on top of an empire to create a civilization. And like this, from the perspective of like, uh, uh, like, a sort of a humanistic democracy or like the classical republicanism that's i mean theoretically possible but it's not a worthwhile objective like the point is you build up from from the bottom basically it's the found the, the tower doesn't stand if there's no foundation and at this point it is sinking into the ground but it is gold decals on the 55th floor that's the way a lot of empires built their apparatus, but this is, that's an interesting way to describe the American hegemon as it stands now and their particular version of liberalism. I mean, in, in a way here, uh, and, and it's good that you mentioned a particular version of liberalism. I mean, since you're an American, but I think us as Europeans will confirm. Well, oh yeah, you are Canadian. God fucking damn it. North American. So yeah, North American. Now let, let, let's go. Let's go with that term. Uh, uh, but I, but ha I've, I, for example, f and I believe Bronze and I am will agree with me that American, the American definition or experience of liberalism has kind of contaminated all others to such a point that all other categories we've mentioned here are either relegated to an historical context or an academic one. Horrifically so, yeah. There's a there's a way that's kind of true. I mean, there's, um, I think one thing that is kind of interesting is to see how um, South America in particular will um, absorb the diminishing of an American hegemon. Um, the thing about like Canada, like as with all like Commonwealth countries is that there is this sense, and it's variegated, but like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, um, within them, these are functionally social democratic country in, in some sense, like compared to the American hegemon, uh, just on a basic level of care. And it's a very basic level, but that fosters a different, like each of them foster these different realities uh, within that. And if there's any value to, um, the like if there's if there's a, a positive take on a theory of nations um it is to to differentiate that and to enable it to survive if the american hegemon collapses uh or to at least be able to adapt because there's a lot of um i think a good example of like i mean people like the roman empire is the obvious one about what happens when empires collapse but like the when the Western Roman Empire collapsed, like it, it, it did, like the, the the level of ancillary structural collapse was very gradual up until that point. But there were these sudden, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, right. These are brush fire wars now. When did that start happening? And the and the, crisis, the crisis of the third century, to be specific. Yep. It's it's the it's the point the point when you realize the empire has fallen is usually a good bit of time after it actually has. Yeah, basically, basically, when the empire e starts eating itself in order to survive, it's the next day is essential is a good metric basically. Yeah. Um. And uh, again, look, there's the, the the need for bottom up development, especially given the reality of of climate change, uh, is. Like it, 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 no matter how it comes, like fun, for demo, for democracy, it, it's like essential for the survival of the concept. But on pretty much any front, that is in some way necessary to just curb the damage. Because if there's a centralized state that does it, like you'd need, you would need this, um, like it, it would be like even 
like it would basically be these degrees of action that would make even a Leninist step back and go, can, can we do that? Can we afford that? Can, can we can we make this succeed? I mean, consider considering like Bengal, well, not Bangladesh is, is now the name, uh, is going to sink under the waves. That the, that the most populous areas of Europe are going to be turned into a into a nigh on inhabitable swamp at, in the best of scenarios. The the the, the damage is quite li- the human the the humanitarian damage is. It struggles to comp- It struggles to parse through, basically. Yeah. Like there's, there's a real sense of like there's. I mean, like there's, there, there's an approach to it. One like of these approaches is there's a website called Corporate Knights. Uh, their uh, for clean capitalism is their uh, is their idea, and basically their idea is this very bright green sort of uh, impulse that. Um, uh, through uh, basically these market incentives, like very specifically neoliberal market incentives, uh, you could like essentially there are going to be um, there corporate action can reverse uh, the impacts of these, and it, it I think it's a good faith venture, but I also think that it's a very blinkered way to look at these relations because uh, there's there's one way to see this, like there, there's the idea that this business apparatus that is is built on sand for the most part uh ironic to think about really will be able to save the plurality of people is is seems nonsensical at this point that it'll be able to save itself may be true but in that case you get this unfortunate outgrowth too again like we mentioned curtis yarvin earlier his idea of an opt-in society is basically the is a, is a authoritarian state premised on the idea of fuck you i got mine and i don't think there's a humane interpretation uh, for that so in view of how that policy is coming about in view of how uh like this i mean uh, anti-democratic liberalism may be the single worst framework to deal with environmental catastrophe because it premises that like the basic premises there are that you know the, the responsibility of large owners will deal with that you can't own air like they, they can't conceptualize a lot of pollution like this is the problem with cap and trade schemes is that cap and trade schemes are like okay you you have the right to pollute as long as you pay for it and then like there's like there's something like that that's they're like oh yeah carbon tax is reductivist it's like well, no. If you if you tax carbon, you tax a vice, like that's and you you don't you don't stop there. But if you have cap and trade, you can't really install punitive measures because it's another part of the commercial apparatus. It it would be essentially like saying you know if you have well if you have for example a very heavy legal gun market, like if there's a say a massive gun lobby, when correspondingly there's a federal gun grab going on. Like those two things don't really work. Like there's no real balance they can accomplish because they don't like they're they're not existentially compatible. And the the thing about that is that there's this the what created this in a large part in large part was this one, this inability to think ahead, but also this inability to conceptualize beyond these beyond what could be on. And one way to deal with that, yeah, is carbon taxation. Like that's one way to deal with it and that's a, certainly a better way than something like cap and trade but like the 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 idea that this can just simply be immersed in it the idea that the um that we are at this end of history and we can simply fold these issues these massive uh, like climatic issues into this apparatus that is already diluting itself and spiraling into dysfunction and that this will result in anything other than a collapse within a collapse is very difficult to believe and kind of to stomach. The problem is, as with anything else, as with any variety of centralization that works along these lines, it will be most palatable to the people who have the most power to implement it. And that is where we stand. 
And on that, uh, and on that uh, somewhat uh, negative like bombshell. Yeah. Seal the line. Yeah. Uh, the the well, this has been uh, Monarchism Unfiltered. I'm one of your hosts, Mikosk. I'm I am. This has been Bronze. I've been the Spruce Goose. Yeah, I mean, I'll see you next uh, next time. Next, yeah, yeah whenever. Yeah. And uh, reblog it on all the Snapstagrams and um, like, comment, subscribe. Or, yeah, see ya.